Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. The big news for late 2014 and now heading into 2015 is the collapse in the price of oil. Now, as I look at my trading screen right here on the 12th of January 2015, I see WTIC crude, that's U.S. crude, falling another 4.8% on the day. It traded for a while at less than $46 a barrel, $46. And Brent crude, the world benchmark, is trading at 47 47 These prices are damaging to oil exploration companies' bottom lines today, tomorrow's hoped-for production, and these prices are destabilizing to an increasing number of oil exporting nations. To help us make sense of all this today, we welcome Gail Dverberg to our program. Gail is a professional actuary who applies her risk assessment expertise to finite world issues. Oil depletion, natural gas depletion, water shortages, climate change, and how this relates to the economy. And for years, Gail authored some of the most informed analysis on the global net energy predicament in her post at the Oil Drum, published under the pen name Gail the Actuary. But today, she runs the very popular blog, OurFiniteWorld.com. And there you will find both intelligent articles and intelligent comments. Gail, thank you so much for joining us again. Well, thank you for inviting me. First, the price of oil. How do you explain the dramatic and so far relentless decline in the price of oil? Simple supply and demand or other factors at work here? Well, I think there's a variety of factors at work. Uh, I think you know one of the things we've noticed is that over the last oh more than 10 years, the cost of extraction has been going up rapidly, but people's wages have not been going up, certainly not as uh, rapidly as the cost of extraction has been going up. Mm-hmm. And, and at the same time, the governments have been doing all kinds of things to try to increase the amount of debt and to try to make debt uh, more accessible. And so they've lowered the interest rates. They've done something which is called quantitative easing, uh, which gets more money out there. And also China has done some things uh, in the growth of its infrastructure, and that has added a great deal of debt as well. Um, And it's added a great deal of demand for oil. But what happens, or what has happened, is that this debt is starting to reach limits, and the fact that it's reaching limits uh, and the fact that incomes aren't really growing to keep up with supply means that we can no longer afford the oil prices we were paying before. So if we can't afford the price of oil, I mean, it's still, you know, the, the numbers I've read is that there's somewhere between a 1% and 2%, let's call it a 1.5% oversupply at this moment. And and I'll admit it's hard to store oil above ground. So even that though that sounds small, it can create issues pretty quickly. But still, a 1.5% oversupply of oil leading to a more than 50% price decline, uh, is, is that normal behavior in your mind? Well, certainly it isn't for other kinds of commodities, but that's what seems to happen for oil. We mm-hmm. get all kinds of strange things, uh, and especially if there's a lot of financial issues behind it, it's really an affordability issue as opposed to a supply issue. Yeah, so let's talk about uh, that relationship really quickly then, because one of the things I harp on a lot, of course, is the relationship between energy and the economy, but specifically oil and the economy. I know you do too. Uh, For our listeners, how important is oil to the global economy generally and to this concept of economic growth specifically? Well, what we need is cheap energy. We need cheap liquid oil. And when it's high priced, it really messes up the economy. Uh, So what we need is you know, that we need oil to run our cars and to operate our trucks and such things, but it needs to be cheap. Well, it's cheap today. It is today, but you have to be able to keep pulling it out at that same price. And the critical thing is that you can't keep pulling it out at that price. And what ha- is going to happen, I'm afraid, is that once it goes down, we won't be able to get it back up again. Really? How, why is that? 
Well, there's several reasons. One of them is that uh, very low interest rates have been helping keep the production up. Once you get your interest rates back up, because there have been a lot of failures, particularly in the shale industry, uh, you know, the costs will be higher so they can't pump it out for the same price that they had it before. But um, there's also the issue that these old wells uh, and need to be uh, produced continuously and they need continuous investment. If you cut that off, it's going to be very hard to restart them. And so, you know, there will need to be uh, an extra investment just to get it back online. And trying to do that becomes extremely difficult when the price is low. You know, so if it's really an affordability issue, you've got a double hurdle then. Not only do you have to get the price up, but you have to get up the price very high so you can get lots of investment dollars so you can kind of make up for lost time besides everything else. And as we know, it takes a long time to get new production online. Yeah, it certainly does. And, and you know, uh, the story that I hear emerging here, it's one that I, I've, I've told a long time ago, and I know other people in the um, peak oil arena have, have said as well, I've heard it from Heinberg, I heard it on the oil drum a lot, is this idea of, a, of, of both high oil prices being a problem and low oil prices being a problem. I mean, that sounds like a real predicament, not a, not a problem. It, it sounds hard to solve. It, I mean, is that really where we are at this point that, that you've just, just said that Above a certain price, um, the economy can't afford the oil, and then there's all these feedback loops that sort of you know impact that whole scenario. But at too low of a price, uh, then oil production can't uh, increase or or even remain stable necessarily. So, it, it, a does do you think is that is that a fair characterization of where we are? And if it is, what does that tell us about where we really are in this story? Yes, I think it is a fair characteris- characterization of the story. Uh, I think, too, that it gets to be even worse than what we think because financial institutions uh, have sold derivatives uh, based on the assumption that things can kind of go along as normal. And so you start seeing very strange uh, motions in terms of uh, the rise of the dollar, the fall of the dollar, and you know a variety of other things besides just these oil price changes. And over time, what you're going to get is a bunch of business failures, and that's going to come through to through these derivatives, and it's going to come through the financial system in a different way than just the oil price itself would. So, uh, you know, we have multiple impacts of these things, some of which are not obvious when you just first look at the story. Well, they're obvious to somebody because we know now that um, within the banking system that, uh, at least in the U.S., it looks like taxpayers have been put on the hook for a portion of the derivative structure that banks carry. And we know that uh, depositors have been moved down uh, the chain of claimants uh, to become almost last in line should a, 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 any sort of a um, bankruptcy or, or other dissolution proceeding happen for a bank. But these derivatives that you're talking about are not just oil derivatives, right? You mean all of them, the credit default swaps, the interest rate swaps, all of those pieces. Those are all basically predicated on this idea that we're going to have robust future growth like we've had in the past, say 4% real GDP globally forever and ever. Is that right? Right. So, right, those models. So what, what – yeah, go, go on with that because I'm wondering what, what do you think happens to, the, to that structure of, of – because to, to me, it's like the, the price of the entire bond market and stock market has a growth component built into it. In the bond market, it's really explicit, uh, and as well as in the stock market. When that growth premium comes out, which is something Jeremy Grantham at GMO has been talking about, other people are starting to get their hands around this. Uh, I don't think that the growth premium has been taken out of the markets yet, but if it does, what, what do you see happening? Well, I think the issue is that it's not exactly a growth premium. It's the fact that it either grows or it collapses, uh, or, you know, that you don't have enough when you get to the end of the time period to pay back your debt with interest. Uh, in other words, a virtuous cycle turns to a vicious cycle. Uh, you know, we hear about Ponzi schemes. Uh, this isn't a scheme as such, but what happens is you end up with a situation where you can't repay debt with interest. 
So that affects everything all the way up from just your basic loans to your derivatives to everything else. And I think that's the issue, one of the big issues that's coming up as we get to lower oil supply or not lower oil supply and inability to keep the prices up with the cost of extraction. Now, I've studied this a bit, and we've chewed these numbers at peak prosperity some. I'm wondering about your take on this. It's it's tricky to get your hands around this idea of, of really what a marginal barrel costs. And, of course, all different projects have a different range. So we know that some Arctic stuff might be uh, have a full cycle cost, 120 or more a barrel. We know there's still a few cheap barrels to be had out there, but the shale production seems to be the world's new marginal producer, meaning that's the one that you can turn to and turn it on or off if the price is right. What's your sense of, of, of what the full cycle or all-in costs are uh, for um, shale? And I understand it varies by region. Obviously, Bakken is different from Eagleford, all of that. But I've seen Wall Street sell site analysts give us numbers as low as 25 a barrel. Uh, my numbers suggest that even at 90 a barrel, I can't find anybody who is turning a profit on a free cash flow basis ever yet so far. Um, so, so where, where have you looked at that, and, and where do you think the truth lies? I don't think we know for sure. I know that all the numbers we've looked at so far are based on a zero interest rate policy and lots of mm-hmm. borrowing with cheap money. So, you know, if it's ninety dollars today, it's not going to be ninety dollars when they come back in again. It's going to be one hundred and thirty-five or one hundred and fifty dollars a barrel. And if it's $25 a barrel today, it's going to be, you know, $50 a barrel tomorrow when they have to pay real interest rates on this stuff. So it's going to change, you know, so even if we did know what the marginal cost of the barrel was today, it doesn't tell us what it will be for the next uh, few marginal barrels. Yeah, it's certainly a moving target because, of course, uh, the cost structure of drilling and fracking a well is rapidly coming down as as uh, labor prices and bid prices for rigs and things uh, comes down. I don't think there's much more than 10 or 15% overall wiggle in those numbers because um, a lot of it's just the cost of steel and, and sand and stuff that, that's a little bit more firm. But at any rate, there is a little wiggle room on that side as well. I'm, I'm just convinced that the all-in cost of production for the companies – uh, when I was looking at it, it was probably closer for on a break even standpoint it was probably closer to one hundred and ten one hundred twenty a barrel. But the thing that always concerned me was i don 't think society 's getting its its proper severance uh, taxes out of that to pay for road damage, bridge damage, the eventual capping costs of abandoned wells, other things like that um, uh, I, It certainly seemed like if you wanted to fully burden the cost of a barrel of oil for for all of the uh, true costs. It would probably have been 150 a while back. That's what I think, but I, you know, hard to get good numbers. Yeah, I would agree with you. And I guess the point I was trying to make was even when you're doing it that way, you not have to be sure to also count in for the fact that that estimate was made with ultra low interest rates. So if you're going to try to put in real interest rates, besides, or you know, interest rates that aren't based on a zero interest rate policy, uh, that costs. You know, if they were $150 fully burdened before, that's comparable to something quite a bit higher if you have a higher interest rate that these folks have to pay when they're trying to, uh, you know, borrow a lot of money in order to try to extract the soil. All right. So let's talk about, um, how about this, peak oil, uh, first of all, real or not? Well, I think that what happens is a financial collapse and as a result, the oil production drops. So it doesn't happen in the order that you think it does. Uh, certainly the conventional oil has peaked, and what has kept it up is all kinds of financial sh- shenanigans. And once these financial sh- shenanigans collapse, uh, the, the whole thing falls down but it doesn't fall down in the way that the peak oil predictions were made. Uh, we have to look at then uh, a blended, there's some geology at play, obviously, like what's happening in the North Sea is probably independent of financial shenanigans to a large extent, uh, although, um, you know, it could it could wiggle a little, I guess. But largely speaking, there's there's some geology, but we have to understand the intersection with prices and the cost of money. Well, I think it's not even that. I don't know if you read my last article. But what I was talking about there 
is, you know, suppose that you have a derivatives problem or whatever. If you have a derivatives problem and you have to go back against depositors, your depositors are things like companies that are making payroll payments. And so the big danger is that these payroll payment payroll funds will be taken in the uh, in this process of taking the money away, uh, you know, to try to get enough money to fund the derivatives problems. Or they might not be derivatives problems. They might be other kinds of problems that are putting banks under. So if you start taking the money from the oil companies that they were going to use to pay their employees, or if you take the money from electricity companies that they were going to use to buy coal or that they were going to use to pay their employees, you have a very bad effect on the economy, which has nothing to do with the shape of the oil depletion curve. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a, yeah, it's a great point. And so, um, what you're talking about here is the is around these bail-in provisions. So, so depositors uh, are supposed to share in the losses by haircuts to their deposits. But uh, just to make sure everybody's following here, the depositors you're concerned about here would be companies who have by default their money in a bank. In fact, I don't know what I would do if I was um, CFO or treasurer of a large company, knowing what I know about the banking system, because you have to ha you have to have your money in a bank. Um, so, uh, if those banks get in trouble and those funds get essentially haircut or frozen or taken, then you're talking about all the follow-on effects that would happen after that. Exactly, and that's the kind of thing that we're up against. You know, it, it's as much the companies being affected as the individuals, but they both can be affected, and they can be affected pretty quickly if that's the kind of uh, a program that's put in place and people don't realize what the follow-on effects are likely to be. And uh, one thing I've found is that is that the people who pass the financial rules seem to be just delightfully unaware of what the following right, effects right, might be. Right. Right. <laughs> so, so um, I've been looking at at peak oil as, as having both a, a geological component. We know that if everything was just firing at all cylinders, there hadn't been an oil price collapse. If if the cost of money hadn't gone away, if everything was going along the Energy Information Association, the EIA, was projecting that U.S. shale output was going to peak around 2020, give or take a year, depending on how you count. Um, and so just holding, just accepting that as being true, we knew that the shale story was really not all that long-lived, right? Um, by 20, right. 2020 is almost tomorrow, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and, and, uh, um, and yet, you know, to me, that was, that was probably the high watermark of international oil production at that point in time, taking U.S. and everything in, in line. Um, with this, the only wild card in there I'm not clear on is Iraq. Iraq clearly could have a lot of extra capacity, I think, if if they could become stable and, and get a lot of investment in there. But barring that, it seemed like we were probably facing this peak around somewhere in that zone. But, you know, the world used to be aware of this, that, that the conventional oil fields that are out there, all the fields that were drilled in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, those fields are depleting at around 4% a year. I'm averaging. Some say as low as 3, some say as high as 6.75%. I'll just take 4. So that means 3 to 4 million barrels per year is, is coming offline from just regular depletion cycles, has to be brought back in through additional investment. So now I want to turn to this part of, of future production, and how you see today's oil price affecting that? Well, as I say, you know, the big issue I see is an affordability issue. And I don't see oil prices uh, bouncing back up again, or certainly not bouncing up very long uh, for very far. So I see oil production, this is basically... You know, the beginning of the end of, you know, it's what we're seeing is the beginning of peak oil, basically, that the oil production will actually permanently turn down at this point because we will not be able to get it back up and because mm -hmm. of all the financial situations coming along. So if that's true, though, um, then give me your follow-on prediction for what happens to the world economy. Well, the world economy 
is what's collapsing. And it's because the economy collapses, the oil production collapses, and as does natural gas and coal at the same time. And the renewables go down at the same time because they just support the electric system, which in the electric system goes down because the electric people can't pay their employees. So you end up with a bad situation all, all over, but it's because of the financial situation. And most people will never, ever figure out that it had anything at all to do with oil. Mm. Yeah, they, they are both uh, very well tied together. So the oil business, really interesting. I mean, if you go, there, there's a great little video I'm going to post on my site I found, which, which basically shows the complete uh, drilling and fracking of a well um, from start to finish, from scraping the pad, and it condenses it all into a minute and a half. And it's just a flurry of activity. And every one of these trucks has specialized people, specialized equipment, specialized tools. Uh, it's a really heavily, heavily complicated business. For that to run, I would, just looking at the number of different types of trucks that show up and all that, I'm going to guess there's several hundred companies making things that mm -hmm. are, are used in that process. And for those several hundred companies to be operating and delivering the things that they're making, you need a functioning economy, right? So, right. Oh, I, I was just thinking you know, back at the time of the 2008 oil crash, one of the things we discovered was that a big problem was there are a lot of the small suppliers that have terrible credit ratings, you know, even if the top company uh, is a big company that has a good credit rating. And what happens to these small suppliers is that they cannot get invest, they can't get uh, the backing, financial backing that they need, so they drop out of the supply lines. And it's the fact that you can't get the supply lines to work that's the big problem. Yeah. Any chance you think that, that, you know, the Fed bailed out the housing market, bought $1.3 trillion of mortgages in order to affect that? Uh, any chance you, you see a, a government response to say, this is too valuable an industry, we have to, we, we can't tolerate uh, uh, this sort of damage here? Well, I think the question is, is, are we really talking about bailing out the financial system? Right. And how big a bailout that really would be? Uh, you know, I... I I don't see that it's going to be the oil industry so much as the financial system, maybe plus the oil industry that we're talking about. And at that point, I think it gets almost to be beyond what they can handle uh, because we're really talking about a fundamental mismatch uh, go at some point. You know, we've made all kinds of promises that production and everything else can continue to expand in the future. You know, the thing that you talked about at the beginning, uh, you know, that we'd have this continuous growth forever and ever. And that promise really isn't true. So at some point, that has to come to the fore. Well, interesting that it would come to the fore as a consequence of low oil prices. That's an interesting wrinkle in this story, potentially, but I, I can see how it would happen. Um, in my lack mind, of affordability. Yeah. affordability. Well, yeah, it's interesting. So I love the way you started by saying, you know, the cost of extraction is up a lot, but wages are not. Wages uh, for the average person are in the doldrums. It was always the broad middle class that really funded the type of consumption that led to the sorts of advances we've had in the past. We see lots of economists confused now by where's our growth because by the headline numbers, things look okay. The problem is they're not analyzing it to the point of saying most of those gains are flowing to a very, very tiny fraction of players and they just pile the money up. So great, you know, we have excess reserves floating around by the trillions and, and all of that. Uh, but that doesn't help anything if you really want this growth. But as you say now, we, we have to at some point as a species or as a, at least as a culture square up to this idea, which is that endless growth was impossible anyway. And we seem to have a system that you said, and I agree with this characterization, is either growing or collapsing. It doesn't seem to have a, a middle ground. Why is that? Well, it's the way that the world is constructed. We are dealing in a competitive system, and each, each species, and in fact, each individual must compete against other individuals and other species. And it's either grow, you know, and expand your population of your species, or let some other species grow and expand the population of their species. And because of that, each 
species has more offspring than needed to reproduce themselves. And it's the ones that get the best control of energy that are able to outbid the other species. And that's what we've been able to do, uh, first through uh, our controlled use of fire over a million years ago. So, you know, this is the way the economy is set up to go. You know, every every little smaller civilization has grown until it reached a point of collapse. There's never been a steady state system that I'm aware of. And this, to me, comes down to, as well, that, that when you have debt-based money and you have an interest rate attached to it, as you mentioned before, in order to, to pay both the principal and the interest in the future, there has to be some sort of growth associated with that. It's not, it just doesn't work otherwise. I, I know some people have put together spreadsheets and said with perfect flows, it, it does, but, but in the real world, it doesn't uh, because you have imperfect flows. And so uh, we really do seem to be trapped in this thing that's, that's grow or die. I'm concerned at this point, Gail, because what I'm looking at in terms of the uh, future production of oil I knew that back, it was January and February of 2014, it was a year ago, Brent was still over 110 a barrel, and all seven oil majors basically said, look, we can't afford to, to explore it at this price of oil and pay shareholder dividends. So CapEx versus dividends, something's got to give. So they either froze or cut CapEx back at 110. Here we are at less than half that number. I have to imagine that uh, those CapEx decisions are just getting absolutely shredded at this point in time. Which means, in my world, if these low oil prices persist for six months or longer, we're going to have future production uh, that's not large enough to sustain the global economy at nearly the pace it needs to grow in order to justify current levels of indebtedness. That was a mouthful, but did that make sense? Right, right, right. The, the cutback that's already flowing, flowing into the system is part of what's going on. And so that oil production, you know, a year from now is going to be down regardless of what happens with all, with all of these cutbacks we're seeing in shale and such right now. So the, the effect is we've got quite a bit of cutback already built into the system, and that's part of the reason why I'm saying that the system now is very well likely to be on a permanent way down because there's, we're going to be down so far there's no possible way we can get back up again. You know, we needed more than the $110 a barrel for the oil majors to keep the prices up back before so, uh, or for them to continue doing their uh, exploration production at the level they needed to. So, you know, they needed a higher price than that. We're not anywhere near there. And we're way, 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 way down now. So that's why I say that I think we're at a point where the oil production is going to end up permanently down. So with with low oil prices, um, uh, demand basically has to follow uh, the, those prices down in some way. Because if demand picks up, and you know, you, the normal supply demand thing would say, okay, so, you know, if we take the price point down, demand will go up and then supply will meet it there magically. Uh, you're saying that because the price has come down, it's likely to stay down because we won't have the sort of economic activity we would need to drive demand up enough to create that price-supply uh, sort of a rebalancing act. Is that right? Yeah, right. And, you know, I, I guess the way I see it is that, you know, sal salaries, what we have is a network system, and salaries are determined, uh, you know, everything is hooked together. And the reason why salaries are so low is because of diminishing returns that we've been uh, reaching already, uh, that more and more is go of our resources are going into oil extraction and they're going into making renewables and they're going into all kinds of other stuff that's not really adding a whole lot to the economic growth of the the rest of the economy. They're certainly not adding proportional output to the the input that they are. So uh, anyhow, I, I I don't see that we can get the uh, growth back again. That's that's fascinating. So uh, you know, as I look at this whole scenario of what's really happening out there. 
um, it, it, always, it feels to me like the price of oil has to at least go back up to the marginal cost of production because the alternative to me is pretty much a collapse in the global economy. I, I can't, and, and you know, people tell me, oh, we've got thin film solar, which has nothing to do with oil. They say, oh, but we're getting electric cars in a fraction of a percent of the total vehicle fleet, uh, that, that, the, that the world's economy is decoupling from oil. I don't see any of that, Gail. I, 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 when I, you know, one of my favorite things to do is maybe go over to Vimeo and look at traffic jams around the world. It's just we are 24-7, 365, a dissipating organism. We are just burning oil all the time. And everything about, like, when, when, I, when I go online and I order something from Amazon and I click and the big brown truck of happiness rolls up my driveway, the supply chain involved in anything that I bought is just so oiliciously dependent on on being transported that I can't for the life of me imagine what people are thinking when they say, oh, we can still have a growing functioning economy with less oil. W what would you say to people who, who make that claim? I'd agree with you. They can't. We can't have a, a functioning economy with less oil. Uh, and, you know, and I think that the financial system is the first part, of, part to go, and that's not real easy to see. So, Gail, one of the places uh, that I've been looking a lot is in the destruction of the, obviously, the equity prices for a lot of the shale drillers as well as other oil companies, service companies. We've seen their debt get hammered a lot. We've seen the cost of capital going up. Besides those obvious places, as you're looking for uh, your clues that the financial aspect of the broader economy is starting to get hit because of this uh, lack of ability to afford sufficient quantities of cheap oil. Where where would you be looking for signs, and what do, what are you looking for? Well, I think what we're going to be seeing is a lot of problems around the world of different kinds. I think the emerging market debt is going to be a problem. I think uh, China may very well be one of the, you know, we consider that part of the emerging market, but I think they especially are going to have a lot of debt. Uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of different problems to get coming together, uh, I think we're also going to see uh, things where it's not just that oil is being cut back, but areas, you know, there's so much of the economy that depends on oil or is related to oil. I think I put together a post where I showed a chart you may have seen elsewhere where uh, the shale states had pretty much all of the increase in employment in recent years, mm -hmm. while the non-shale states are still way beyond, behind on jobs. Uh, you know, so you get a situation where there are a lot of different pieces of the economy that are doing badly at the same time. Uh, so it, it's a little hard to say that exactly what it is that brings the whole thing down, but it, it's a combination of things. It may even be that the Federal Reserve raises the interest rate. Raising interest rates will really bring the U.S. economy down if it's more than just, you know, a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage or a fraction of a percent, uh, because that is something that is the lever that they use to get, uh, that, that they've been trying to use to offset the oil price, uh, high oil prices. So that could be one of the big pieces, too, that pushes the economy down. Now, I've heard it said, uh, I think it was Jim Puplava, I thought it was very right at the time, a few years back, he said that the um, price of oil is the new Fed funds rate, meaning as the price of oil goes up, it's providing a resistive effect on, on the overall economic growth. And now that the oil price has declined, it would have the reverse, it would have a stimulative effect. Uh, what, do you, what do you say, I, I read a lot of comments where people say, oh, this is unequivocally good, you know, lower oil prices means consumers pay less for fuel, that's just a positive. Well... It's good from a, a first order kind of a look at things, but the fact that you can't pull, keep pulling the oil out at that rate is a big problem. And the fact that there's a lot of follow on effects uh, that you don't see immediately, you know, and, and part of those follow on effects are in other countries around the world too. You know, we need Saudi Arabia and we need all of the other countries, even Venezuela and, uh, and all of our exporters to continue their exporting. Well, if the uh, governments fail, then it's not that they just cut back a little bit on their oil production. They are likely to be cutting back a whole lot on their oil production. 
Interesting. Yeah, you know, the the um, piece that's come up a lot for me is, is I, I've read, honestly, very qualified economists say that, uh, you know, this lower oil price is going to be a big boost to GDP because it puts all this disposable income back in people's pockets. Like, whoa, big boys and girls, uh, GDP is just a, is a macro statistic. So to the extent that, that oil companies operating in the U.S. and uh, the whole chain from, from refining through distribution and retail, that, that the extent to which they're receiving less money and consumers are receiving that benefit on their side, that's a zero on, on the GDP ledger. Nothing happened there. The only thing that, that matters is if you're importing oil, it's, it's a positive because your imports deduct from your exports to give you an overall GDP boost or decline depending on how those numbers balance out. So uh, I, was, I see a little bit of a gain for the U.S. because we still do import a lot of oil, you know, five, six million barrels a day. And, and so, so we're paying less for that. That will boost GDP. But otherwise, it's kind of a wash, isn't it? Well, you know, I sat down and I wrote uh, one post, uh, I think it was called 10 Reasons or Why a S Severe Drop in Oil Prices is a Problem. And as I sat down and looked at it and enumerated it, I realized that, you know, there were things that people are not taking into account in that analysis. And it's a lot worse than what you think. It, it, there's enough bad effects you know, if you take uh, some kind of a hole and divide it into two pieces, well, we'll say an egg, you know, the two pieces are not this equal to the one together. It, it really changes the whole, whole situation materially. And it's the fact that it's materially changed that uh, is a problem. You know, you can't put your egg back together again after you break it, even if you could say, why? That's, you know, the same egg that you had before, uh, even if you've cracked it in two. Well, absolutely. And so as we look at the the spill-on effects that would happen here, so, I, you know, North Dakota is going to have to wrestle with some stuff. They're, they're going to have to figure out what a bust feels like in this story. But if you lose a $100,000 truck driving job in, in that area, there's all the second-order things that you would lose as well, the, the, the demand for the burger flipper at 20 an hour and the maid at 25 uh, cleaning rooms in the hotel that's selling rooms for 200 a night, all of that stuff gets impacted as well. So, so the loss of a little bit of, of oil revenue can really ripple through an economy, can it? Exactly. Right. And, and one of the things I discovered as I was looking at this is things like, you know, you assume that all of this oil, uh, this savings is going to go back to the consumer. Well, are airlines going to give the uh, lower oil prices back to the consumer? No. You know, they're not going to lower their prices. They're going to take one of the empty planes they've got sitting around from 2008 and put it back in the air because there's not much cost of doing that. And they're going to try to run more planes rather than, than trying to actually uh, reduce the fares to give the, uh, the savings in oil price back to the consumers. So that, that uh, as we look forward then, uh, what, do you th what do you see happening? You, you said you don't see oil prices rising anytime soon. Or do you, or do you literally mean... Like, what would your, what would your uh, prediction for oil prices for 2015 actually be here? It probably will bump along, but we're probably talking down the $20 barrel range. $20, okay. Um, simply because uh, somebody can make money selling it at that range, or, uh, or uh, that's just where you see demand falling for this? Well, I think because we end up with so many financial problems. Ah, uh, yeah. So then, it, then, then the... It, issue as to how bad does the financial system come out? How many derivative problems do we have? How many problems do we have of other sorts? How much haircuts being done of people's bank accounts? That kind of thing. Yep. Well, so then this sort of squares up with my personal opinion prediction is that I think there's a, a deflationary impulse. For a long time, I, I, I thought for sure inflation was going to win. I kind of believed the whole helicopter money would do it, but they failed to get the money in the hands of people. They got it into the hands of a concentrated set of speculators. That, that didn't do the trick. So it looks to me like now we're seeing more deflationary impulses than anything, China being a big wild card in this, but they went through their building boom. They are absolutely not importing nearly the same amounts of coal, oil, steel, copper, the big four I track for the macro story. Europe's in trouble. Um, and the United States, uh, despite the 5% GDP reading, which was really just a whole lot of 
Obamacare brought forward into a single quarter for a nice a nice bump effect. Um, uh, I, I'm seeing deflation as, as the impulse. That's a scary proposition to our world leaders. I think they'll fight it with everything they've got because deflation destroys institutions, it wrecks whole economies, it ruins financial systems, and it, most importantly, uh, shortens political careers. So um, do you agree that, that you would, in your $20 noil, I, I'm, I'm projecting that what you're saying is there's a deflationary impulse on our way? Exactly. You know, and it makes debt harder to repay, so you end up with more and more countries having difficult, difficulty with all of the debt they have outstanding, and the businesses in those countries having difficulty with their debt. So what if the Federal Reserve went wild? That happens, and, and they just go wild, and they say, great, we're going to just give everybody money. I don't care how they do it. They might give everybody a retroactive tax rebate for the last three years, or they might just send checks or have the government do it, but then fund the deficit. Who cares? So what would, what would, would your opinion of all this change if the Fed just threw even more money at this? Well, I don't know. It, it may delay things. You know, It may keep things, the financial crash that I'm concerned about, about, you know, make it go out a few months or even a year or two. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've managed to do some amazing things so far. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that are possible that maybe you could kind of keep keep the balls up in the air for a little bit longer. Um, but, you know, when you look at it, you say there, it can't go on indefinitely. But maybe they can figure out something. I don't know. Uh, it, it certainly doesn't give us a corresponding amount of real buying power because there's not that much stuff to be bought. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. So, so this is this is really an interesting. This is this is why I love to keep focusing on the energy because energy is everything in this story, as far as I'm concerned, and that and that we can't have an analysis around just the economy and hope to get anywhere without really understanding the master resource because energy is everything. And so peak oil community has been talking about net energy and the role of that and energy returned on energy invested. And obviously we're, we're slowly swapping high net energy oil for less high net energy oil. And, uh, and, and we're in this part where I just can't see global growth returning like people are counting on or like financial models are counting on. And, and because of that, um, I just have a sense right here, Gail, of, of tremendous pressures building because the financial and the fiscal and monetary authorities are blissfully unaware of that part of the energy story you and I are talking about. And so they just keep pushing and pushing, creating more debt, more derivatives, more lending, more money, more claims. And I think you said it best that, that it's the amount of real stuff that matters at the end of the day, not the claims. The claims are just piling up over there. So that is a pressure, if you will, that's going to connect at some point. And either the economy really takes off and, and rip or grows to the future or the claims have to get reduced. You're saying that's where we're headed. In fact, we're almost there. Right, right. Uh I think, though, that the claims in the future, they, they really do play a role, though, in trying to keep the price of oil up. And if you don't have your debt growing, you can't keep the price, price of oil up. So cutting back on debt creates a real problem in terms of oil price. And that's sometimes one, one thing that people don't understand when they say, oh, we need to just roll back things. Well, you can only roll back things if you can keep your prices up high enough. Interesting. Interesting. Well, uh, fascinating thoughts there. And we're out of time for this. And I really want to thank you for your time today. So again, just remind people, tell them about your excellent website and how to get there. Okay. My name is Gail Tverberg, T-V-E-R-B-E-R-G. And the name of my uh, website is our, which O-U-R, finite, F-I-N-I-T-E, world. Dot com. So it's OurFiniteWorld.com, Gail Tverberg, but either one of those will get you. If you put my name in, you can get to it as well. And, and there's just some fantastic articles there, full of data, very well done. So, Gail, thank you so much for today and for the work you do in, in uh, analyzing and spreading the word. Well, and thanks for inviting me.